Bonjour, chers amis. Bonjour, chers amis. Hello, everyone. Hello, dear guests. Welcome to this activity. Welcome to this uh, francophone panel in the country of Uncle Sam. I am Flavid Haid. I work at the Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques. And it's a great pleasure to be with you today. We have an activity that is offered in both languages today, both in French and in English. We have simultaneous interpretation. To select your language, you have to click on the interpretation button. You'll see there's a small globe at the bottom of your screen. Today. So you can choose your language. To choose the language, just click the interpretation button at the at your screen. Un mot sur le déroulement de notre activité. No. Alors, a few words on uh, this event. Each panelist will make a presentation of about eight to ten minutes. Following those presentations, there will be a Q&A session with the audience. So all throughout the panel, I would like to welcome you. I would dearly welcome you to uh, write your questions, comments, and react in the chat box and please select the option to write to all panelists and attendees so that we can look at your questions and comments so now to get us started it is a great pleasure to introduce to you michel robitaille michel robitaille is the chair of the board of the centre francophonie des amériques he has a, over 40 years of experience in terms of international relations. Mr. Robitaille has held several positions in the Quebec diplomatic network among those a general delegate in New York, delegate general in Paris, and personal representative of the premier for the Francophonie. So, dear Michel, chairman, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you for this webinar on the French presence in the U.S. and the country of uh, Uncle Sam, as the publicity says. So I wanted to tell you that the uh, Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques is holding this activity as part of his uh, uh, program during the month of the Francophonie as a fruit of the collaboration between the, the, the uh, delegation, the Quebec delegation in Boston, Washington, Chicago, and Houston. All of the initiatives of our center emphasizes a plural, diverse Francophonie, both in Canada and the US, in Latin America and Central America, and in uh, Antilles. So in order to understand this Francophonie properly, it's important to understand where these Francophones, where they come from, how those migrations, immigrations happened. It's a, a duty for us to understand. And this is what this panel will be looking into. I'd like to thank all those present here today. You are, oh, there's over 300 of you have signed up for this webinar from 20 country, obviously uh, from the Americas, but even beyond. We have people from Europe and Africa also who signed up. So now I'd like to give the floor to Marie-Claude Francoeur, who is a Quebec delegate to Boston. She uh, is in this position since 2014, and she's a, an expert in the Quebec relation in uh, the US, even in her academic training is sort of in between because she's a Laval, McGill graduate, a Syracuse University alumni also, uh, in uh, international relations and senior management uh, governance graduate from uh, Harvard. Before having this position, she worked in, uh, in politics, not as elected official, but in cabinets, even the premier's cabinet. And I think that, which is quite unique uh, at the uh, uh, Assembly Nationale and the House of Commons in Ottawa, so quite specific. So, Michael, it's a pleasure to give you the floor. 
Thank you, Michelle, for this introduction. This uh, reminds me not so far off past. Hello, everyone, and what an initiative, what an activity we have today to celebrate Francophonie in the Americas, especially the contribution and heritage of uh, French Canadians in the U.S. We'll have the pleasure to look at this story commented to us, a specialist of different areas in the U.S. This is the fruit of collaboration between the Centre Francophonie Amérique and the delegations of Quebec to Boston, Chicago, Houston, and uh, uh, Washington, Washington, yes, along with Jean-Francois. Thank you for being here. We all have the same mission to promote the French language and to highlight the substantial contributions of French Americans to the current history. Now I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists, signing with Mr. Nathan Rabelais. He is an assistant professor in French studies at the Louisiana Lafayette University and associate researcher at the Louisiana Research Center. He studies oral traditions and French culture in, and and uh, uh, um heritage in Louisiana. Ms. Uh, Sarah Fayen Scarlett is co-director of the Queen Up Tri Time Traveler Project, an interactive project online. She will be talking about the presence of French can uh, Amer Canadians in the Midwest and Great Lakes area. Our last panelist, Mr. Patrick White, is a professor in journalism at the Media School at the Université du Québec à Montréal and also founder of HuffPost Quebec, has a degree from Laval University. Uh, and he will be talking about the immigration wave of French Canadians to New England since uh, from uh, 1840 to 1930. And finally, Aaron, Aaron Emmett is coroner of French uh, studies at the University of Georgetown in Washington. He is a social linguist by trade and his research mainly targets dialects of French in Louisiana. So ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie-Claude, and welcome all. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Nathan Rabelais for our first presentation on Louisiana. So, Nathan, if you're ready. Yes, yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much, Aaron, for this introduction. Can you see my slides properly? Yes. Fantastic. So, hello, everyone. Hello, and thank you to, I'd like to thank the center and all the organizers for extending this invitation. It is a pleasure to be with you tonight. I really do appreciate the theme of uh, this event, of this panel, because it made me think differently about the French context of Louisiana. I tend to talk about all the diversity of French communities, and Creole communities in Louisiana. Oftentimes in media, we tend to simplify and oversimplify things because the question is directly about the presence uh, uh, in a French Canadian presence. I find it interesting because Louisiana is a more complex case than other regions might be because its roots date from the colonial age and era. So I'll start with the beginning of uh, colonialism, Louisiana, and talk about uh, the cultural identity of Louis uh, Louisiana. So if we go back in time, at the beginning of the colonial period, let's remind ourselves that borders were quite different at that time. The, the What we know as, the, as Canada and the US did not exist as such. And so it's a, sort of, uh, and chronic they talk about these people who settled in Louisiana in the 18th century would probably not have recognized these identities as such. Uh, so here's a map of New France, France in blue, uh, New England uh, positions in red, and and, uh, and then what was seated in 1713. Uh, there we go. 
in Montreal, we have an explorer who guided a first expedition to what is known uh, in 1699. Why are they going to touch with the uh, with uh, First Nations? Later in 1702, that base was displaced to Mobile, Mobile in Alabama. Shakhtar Chickasaw held them to navigate that territory and to uh, better defend. Jean-Baptiste Lemoine de Bienville, uh, the elder brother of Louis Lemoine de Berville, also served as go governor of the French colony three times between 1702 and 1743. So you see also on this map that Louisiana comprise what we call Alabama, Mississippi, among others. So when we're talking about lower Louisiana in the south of the country of the Illinois, well, meaning high Louisiana, and even lower Louisiana was much larger than the what the, the state we know as Louisiana now. So immigration, so Franco-Canadian immigration, if we can call it as such, continues during the colonial uh, French colonial period. You probably know the great disturbance, the Grand Dérangement in French, the uh, Acadian deportation starting in uh, 1755, lasting for several years. British separate uh, families, send them away apart from each other in France and colonies with the target of uh, preventing the constitution of a nation together and thousands were uh, died through this and among survivors uh, in the community several were looking to recreate a new uh, Acadie and Louisiana had great benefits of uh, mostly French Catholic uh, area with also uh, land from the from colonial Spain so, so a few key dates, 1764 is the end of uh, New France. The following year, uh, Louisiana is ceded to Spain. And that is also the year where the first Acadians arrive in Louisiana, nine years after the start of the great uh, deportation. Over about 20 years and several waves of immigration, around 3,000 Acadians settle in Louisiana. At that moment, Louisiana is still a Spanish colony, and that government wanted to, well, for them, it was a strategy to settle and to occupy a territory. So they didn't want to displace them. A historian talks about a second uh, Cajun diaspora. 1803, Louisiana is sold, Louisiana purchase. 1812, Louisiana becomes the 31st American state. Here are the orders we know now. In red, we have Louisiana. And here's the part of Louisiana that we mostly are talking about. And that is the part that was the most uh, French and Creole speaking. During the 19th century, the term Cajun, it comes from a Cajun, applied to a lot of the Francophone population in Louisiana as an euphemism of poor white French speaking, regardless of if they had uh, Cajun origins or not. And that was e that even had a pejorative connotation. That is not the case anymore, obviously. I think Cajuns today, even if they do not speak French, are proud of their heritage. Acadians integrated the Louisiana uh, a society. Uh, we have a lot of diverse community. In Louisiana, we had a, already a language cultural pool of uh, Creole and French speaking, but hard to distinguish between uh, pure ancestors and other, other white or colored Creole. That's why today we find very proud white Cajuns called Romero or McGee, but also colored called Brossard or Landry. The language, culture, and gene genealogy uh, is really shared across the territory. The Cajun identity 
uh, specifically the Cajun uh, identity, yes, is still alive today and plays a big role in the collective uh, memory of the state and heritage, even if uh, Fran uh, French uh, really uh, fell off a cliff last century. Along with Chlorophyll, the Center for of Development of the French Language, many teachers uh, taught in our immersion schools in Louisiana. And there's also several institutional relations between uh, Canada and Louisiana, especially with uh, Quebec and uh, Acadie. Uh, for example, the St. Anne immersion program, a lot of Louisianian uh, take that opportunity, music programs, uh, Twin Cities, and other examples. So I'll conclude on this. Thank you very much once again, and talk to you soon. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for our second presentation. We have Sarah Fayan-Scarlett, who will be speaking in English about the Great Lake areas in the Midwest area. For you and the audience, do not hesitate to type in your questions and use the chat uh, if you want to. And things over to you. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you to everyone for inviting me to join you tonight. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about some new and ongoing research about immigrants from Quebec coming to Northern Michigan uh, and how it fits into the larger story of Francophones in the Great Lakes. So I am one of about 40 researchers participating in a seven year project called Trois Siècles de Migration Francophone en Amérique du Nord covering the years 1640 to 1940, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The project is headed by Dr. Yves Frenette at Université de Saint-Boniface and includes researchers from Canada, the US, the Caribbean, and Europe. And the project seeks to connect rich historical data contained in Quebec's demographic database called Balzac with US census records and other kinds of historical data to gain a more full and complex view of Francophone experience across history and geography. I wanna acknowledge my colleague uh, who I work with at Michigan Technological University with whom I am working on this project, Dr. Don Lafreniere, and also Dr. Jean Lamar, a collaborator whose book, uh, French Canadians in Michigan has informed our work. So one of several areas of geographic focus for the project is the Great Lakes. And the history that most people know about Francophones in the Great Lakes circulates around the fur trade. And the expert in this material uh, um, in our research group, or one of the experts is Nicole Saint-Ange, a historian at the University of Ottawa. And she has spent 20 years demonstrating the extent to which the fur traders lived extraordinarily mobile lives by tracing employees of the American Fur Company as they pursued profit throughout the continent St. Ange has complicated our understandings of the Métis culture, arguing that the families and communities created by Francophone fur traders and Indigenous Americans evolved to include even more diverse identities than generally assumed. So my research, uh, by contrast, seeks to uncover histories of French Canadians in the Great Lakes in a later time period, the industrializing 19th and early 20th century. And as a case study for this era, my colleagues, students, and I are focusing on the region surrounding our university, the Keweenaw Peninsula. It's sort of the upper, the upper peninsula's upper peninsula, if you will, sticking out into Lake Superior from Michigan's northern half. Geologically speaking, the Keweenaw boasts global notoriety, featuring some of the purest native copper deposits in the world, many left on the surface when the last glaciers receded. Humans have been working copper here for at least 7,000 years, as indicated by archaeological finds in Missouri, Iowa, and elsewhere that indicate a wide trade network long before European contact. Samuel de Champlain noted in his early accounts of the St. Lawrence that two Algonquin men showed him a large piece of very pure copper that was abundant, quote, on the bank of a river near a large lake. 
which historians generally believe described Keweenaw copper. While the French and later the British attempted to start mining copper here, it was the American government that invested enough to develop profitable mining in the region starting in the 1840s after a series of treaties with the Ojibwe. By the 1870s, the Keweenaw or the copper country as it came to be known was providing the US with three quarters of all of its copper. Hard rock mining experts from Cornwall and German speaking areas of Europe came in large number and as the potential of this mining region became clear, merchants and entrepreneurs in support industries began to arrive, among them industrious families from Quebec seeking a foothold in the new market economy. So I would like to share with you tonight the story of one family whose migration to and legacy in the Keweenaw I have been pursuing uh, with an, one of my undergraduate students named Brooke Batterson. Joseph Grégoire was born in L'Acadie, Saint-Jean, Quebec in 1833, about 40 kilometers southeast of Montreal and baptized at Sainte Marguerite de Blairfindy. His family started a farm in nearby Saint-Valentin in the 1840s, but Joseph, the oldest of 13 children, left home in the 1850s and headed toward the Great Lakes. Records place him at multiple iron and copper mines where he followed in the footsteps of many French Canadians and learned logging and carpentry. Gregoire set up a lumber mill at the head of a small inland lake on the Keweenaw Peninsula called Torch Lake. This provided a protected waterway, access to Lake Superior and a reasonably central location from which to harvest the virgin timber throughout the peninsula. And timber harvesting, of course, was big business throughout the Great Lakes at this time, with millions of logs being shipped every year via the rivers and lakes down to Chicago to fill up train cars heading west to build the boom towns on the Great Plains. And of course, uh, the Gregoire's lumber also went toward building booming copper country towns. We know that Gregoire supplied the lumber for some of the largest, most ambitious structures in the region, including the house of the Quincy Mining Company agent, an enormous Italianate structure, uh, which you see in the upper right, and the receipt uh, for which you see below it. Gregoire built a similarly lavish home for his own family, by which this time, um, which by this time included his brother Patrice and children. Joseph himself had no children. They also built a town for their workers called Gregoryville, reflecting the anglicized version of their name. This company town housed 310 French Canadians in 1870. But perhaps Gregoire's most lasting legacy in the uh, is the parish of St. Joseph in Lake Linden, which began to grow and attract the French Canadians not directly employed by Gregoire. He donated the lumber to construct the first church building, which resembled many throughout Quebec, and then in 1912, it was replaced by an enormous church built with locally quarried red sandstone, which today continues to pay homage to many founding Francophone families. Even after the Gregoire family shut down their lumber mill in 1910, French continued to be a common language spoken in this town with three French language newspapers. Chapters of La Société Saint-Jean-Baptiste and L'Association Canado-Américaine thrived. So one goal of the Trois Siècles project in our region will be to partner with the Keweenaw National Historical Park to create a community-led exhibition to situate the French Canadian immigrants in this region among the many immigrant groups whose histories tend to be better remembered and studied. This region was among the most diverse in Michigan around 1910 and Francophones are among the groups whose stories really need better research and public programming. The Trois Siècles project organizers are planning a summer school for 2024 in the Keweenaw for researchers or anyone interested in learning on the ground about French Canadian heritage in the region. Uh, another way information will be available for anyone to access is through an online historical atlas called the Keweenaw Time Traveler. Uh, I co-direct this digital history project, which makes it possible to explore historical maps click on a house on that map and find out who lived there at different times. You can also search by name, entering a familiar Quebec surname, for instance, and finding all the residential addresses where people by that name lived and worked. The stories of the Gregoires and their community are just one example of the many that need to be told 
After all, in 1890, 26% of all French Canadians in the US lived around the Great Lakes, and almost half of those were in Michigan. So we hope uh, that this ongoing research can connect their stories to other like those, others like those that we are hearing tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Merci beaucoup. Merci Thank you very much. Now, it's my great pleasure to give the floor to Patrick White for his presentation on New England and immigration. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm speaking to you from Montreal. And despite my English sounding name, I am a French speaker. So we'll be talking about French Canadian immigration in New England, 1840 to 1930 over a hundred years. Thank you very much for the invitation tonight. And my experience is uh, as journalist from CTV News, journalist from Reuters, director from La Presse Canadienne, canoe.ca, Half Post, Quebec, and uh, in uh, Journal de Quebec. When you're talking about this immigration in the US, it's from uh, 1840 to 1930, we're talking about 900,000 Catholic French-speaking immigrants. Now would be the equivalent of about 15 million people in the US of French Canadian descent. And the Quebec would have 4 million more inhabitants if it hadn't been the case. So we should be 12.6 million inhabitants if it wasn't for this exodus or exile in the 19th and 20th century. So two thirds settled in New England, most of them uh, saw themselves as temporary visitors and uh, French Canadian colonies were called Little Canada, Little Canada. So these were neighbors such as uh, Lil Well and Massachusetts. So this was an important period. What has happened, this immigration? Well, in Maine, Vermont, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, what do you call it? New England. What are the most spoken second languages after English in the US, obviously, beyond English and Spanish? Well, we still see that in the East Coast of Canada and also in Louisiana, French is the third most spoken language as of 2017 in the US. So uh, French speaking North America was a real concept or at the time a lot of the North America belonged to France. France sold the U.S. to Great Britain in uh, 1763, including the uh, Mississippi. Uh, Florida was ceded to the U.S. along with uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, west of Mississippi. Yes, as previously mentioned. If we look at this map here, it was it's really uh, vulnerable to see what was nor French North America, what belonged to France is in blue here. Now, if we can imagine now uh, French speaking US and a large part of Canada, that would be quite a sight. Now, the main cities founded by French speakers, uh, several cities, Biloxi, Davenport, Detroit, uh, Mobile, New Orleans, St. Joseph, St. Paul, Joliet, a lot of cities founded by French Canadians. Now, who are the most known the French Canadian descendants? Madonna, Jack Kerouac, uh, I see the well-known uh, writer, uh, woman, the wife of Elvis Presley, Ryan Gosling, and uh, many other famous people in the US who have a close relation, close uh, heritage. The evolution of demographics from uh, 1840 to 1860, uh, hundreds of thousands of French Canadians were exiled between, uh, so in the 1900s were close to 600,000, 715 total, in nine, around in 1920 and around 1930 with the decline of French Canadian immigration, the total was already close to a million people leaving Quebec. So around 1900, we have several 
major uh, majorities of Canadian, French Canadians, Lowell, Manchester, one socket. They had more French Canadians than uh, uh, medium-sized towns in Quebec. It was a nation within the U.S. and that exodus is the more uh, the most significant French Canadian event in the 19th century. We talk about these French Canadians that created their own institution in the East Coast with uh, uh, parishes, churches, newspapers, hundreds of newspapers, uh, credit unions, the Jardin credit unions, there were society with these Saint Jean Baptiste with minimum contact outside of them. So, what would be the causes of this emig emigration? Because there was no religious persecution, no major political instability. On 1776, 1776, several French Canadians uh, supported the American rebels against the against Great Britain. Uh, the government giving them uh, land around New York, and they started to populate uh, Cambridge and other towns. Other causes? Other root causes? Well, there was some political agitation under uh, the Governor Craig in Canada, which led to economic difficulties and families to settle in Vermont. Then we had the uh, Great Rebellion of the Patriots between 1837-38, in Lower Canada, Quebec today, had forced the losers, Patriots, to ex uh, exile to St. Albans, Rouse Point, Burlington, and Vermont. A large, that was a large uh, French speaking city at that point, Alberg and Swanton. The main causes, well, first demographics. Uh, the exodus of French Canadian does not have anything with the desire for adventure. The French Canadian population was doubling every 25 years. In the 19th century, the uh, birth rate was 50 per 1,000, and the population went from 335,000 inhabitants in 1815 to 600,000 in 1840. So a large demographic growth, but a lack of good uh, farm lands. And between 1784 to 1844, the population grew by 400%. What would be the causes in Quebec? Well, the lords in Quebec own lordships, increased taxes, limited number of lands sold to, in order to benefit from the high cost of wood that was in high demand in Great Britain. For example, farmers in Beauce left for Maine because of this. Cost ways to find a job in Quebec, which only had 42,000 inhabitants in Montreal, 57,000 with limited job opportunities. Cities over fifteen, oh, cities over a thousand people accounted for less than fifteen percent. So once again, the wood production, the wood industry, was very important. Other causes, well, agriculture. We modernized farm equipment starting in eighteen forty, uh, industrialization, which led to job losses, industrial machinery. Then in four to five days, what employees could accomplish in two or three months? A lot of uh, poor people with no job, hungry, uh, and late 19th century. And then we had uh, refugees from Ireland, 625,000 Irish uh, people arriving in the port of Quebec from 1830 to 1850 because of uh, potato famish in Ireland, bad harvests also in Quebec in 1830 for wheat and potatoes. We were building uh, canals, uh, railroads, increasing competition with Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Upper Canada, and a crisis that started to have dramatic proportions. Low income fam for families, lower income for families, a competition with Upper Canada, a lot of young adults unable to find jobs. People were not able to pay monthly bills uh, unless all family members were working, including women working a lot and going to the U.S., was the only solution to survive. Permanent or temporary exile was the last re recourse because of the industrial sector's difficulties be be before 1860. A large financial crisis in 1837, Great Britain, yes, and a depression that lasted uh, 14 years. Great Britain also abolished preferential rates for Canadian wheat and wood and lumber. So these crises had dramatic impact on trade. 
who were these French Canadians, many of them farmers, indebted up to the neck because of uh, bank debt and equipment. Only one bar bad harvest and everything was lost with assets being seized uh, and forced exile from many of the U.S. The situation was that bad that the lower Canada Parliament created a committee in 1839 on the causes, uh, 1869, the causes of immigration. And the beginning of railroads made it easier to leave Canada. So growth of American economy, cotton, shoes, uh, New England, obviously controlling everything, uh, producing, so a lot of staff, low wages, and we needed French Canadians. So a rapid urbanization of New England uh, was operated at that time. Houses, uh, mills, plants to buy, new roads to build, uh, water systems. New England passes New England. Uh, it becomes a first preferred destination, many twin cities. Now, getting close to 10 minutes, I know it's a little bit too much, but uh, how did these people live? This exile was like a jail sentence. They wanted to go back to Quebec, help families to reimburse debt. It was hard for farms, low wages, poor conditions and the religion obviously being a significant issue. We'll talk about this later to talk about assimilation of French Canadians. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you also to Sarah and Nathan. Now we'll jump to the Q&A period, a discussion period. Before tonight, we received several questions, if I may. I'd like to go back uh, first to Nathan for one question. Uh, you talked about relations between Canada and Louisiana, but can you also talk about other francophone groups that we can find in Louisiana today? Yes, of course. Can I just go back to the slide that I, I had? I'll just try to show it. Okay, so this is a chart produced by my colleague and friend Joseph Dunn that shows about 18 French speaking groups uh, that settled in Louisiana. This doesn't mean that all those identities are still present or still very strong today. Let me see with time well these labels and are, are limited to creole cajun uh natives especially with civil war there was a, a strong racialization of these terms where creole for me people this means uh, uh somebody is colored but this was not always the case it was not a racial identity previously but i would say today when talking about major groups we mostly talk about cajuns creole colored creole uh, white creole also and uh huma nation a first nation uh, but also we have to understand that these labels go beyond the language identity so being creole or cajun does not necessarily mean that you are french speaking especially for many creole even today the creole identity is not really related to race so the west african presence i think is really sub uh, underrepresented in our image of louisiana for example in the colonial period most of half of the period of the the population were slaves, but that influence is clearly evident in cuisine, in music, and language even. But we tend to really look into look into the Cajun component, but there's a, a big diversity. Thank you. Sarah, a question for you. 
um, or I guess two two part question. <laughs> really is, is first, um, what happened to the folks um, in Gregoryville after the sawmill shut down um, in terms of, of occupation? And I guess the flip side of that or the other side of that is also did did that shut down hasten any any bit of assimilation in the region from francophone to anglophone great thank you aaron um so you know, there has always been the thought uh here in this region that um french canadian families really preferred to work above ground rather than underground in this mining region um and we know that was the case early on when people came to work in gregoryville in the lumber mill um but so what one thing we've done is compared the those families who came to gregoryville in the 1880 census to people with the same surname in the 1900 census to see that change over a generation. And we do see a, some jump of num percentages of people working in the mining companies. But one thing we're hoping to find out more about is what were they doing in the mining companies? Because one job we know they had um, was not mining the rock, but actually bringing big giant tree trunks underground to hold up the rock above um, the miners' heads. It was a, a, a job called a timberman. Um, but one thing, so we want to learn more about that. But we also see by 1900, some of those uh, same families noting uh, that they were working in farming, which we had not seen in 1880. So um, they may have uh, um, sort of um, uh, gone back to some of their farming traditions from Quebec, but we want to learn more about exactly which families they were in those generations. So that's one of our questions. Um, and your second part of your question is whether the closing of the Gregoryville lumber mill, um, how that affected some assimilation. Um, and it probably did. I didn't have a great map, but um, when they left Gregoryville, they would have had to go over and live uh, um, in the town of Lake Linden. And what we found in terms of where they were living Living, we've mapped them that they do appear to be quite integrated. There's not a you know francophone section of town, um, so so it probably did. Yeah, but that's among the questions we'll be asking. Thank you so much. No, oh, thank you. No, c'est très intéressant, and especially this part. Um, you mentioned the the surnames, which we're going to come back to in a little bit for for all three of our panels because we got quite a few questions yep. on that. Um, mais d'abord. Patrick, but first, uh, Patrick, I'd like to keep going on the, the discussion with assimilation, uh, especially in New England. So what happened with uh, assimilation? Did it take a long time? Was it done quick, quite quickly? And so, well, it's done over one, two, well, really three generations. Religion was a major problem because masses were in English and uh, Quebecers, well, at that point, uh, were very Catholic. There were several traditions between the liturgy of uh, Roman Catholic Church in Quebec, and uh, we could not have, uh, uh, we could not confess in uh, French. Parishes were managed differently, and many French Canadians stopped going to church so the, uh, during the exodus and the exile, oh, they became Protestant. So that's a reality. Many French Canadians made the choice to integrate by learning English, uh, stop uh, speaking French by uh, fear of being marginalized, and also a high feeling of inferior, inferiority. Dubois, La Croix, Bois Vert, uh, changed to wood, cross, greenwood, uh, in order to stop Ostracize, ostr ostracization and racism because some of that happened and also the necessity to communicate in English uh, with the foreman, what we call the foreman, obviously, and also in ret retail stores with the authorities, uh, with doctors, with other workers. Assimilation was fast and many of them decided to stay in the US. Also in Canada, we had many uh, illiterates that was an issue, but we still created uh, newspapers, patriotic societies, parishes, and uh, really a lot of work was done. What happened to conclude on assimilation, uh, U.S. states st started to adopt uh, very strict 
laws, not necessarily against French, but a uh, slow assimilation was made. Uh, archbishops tried to impose English, 14 million uh, immigrants arrived. Uh, we considered French Canadians to be the Chinese and Northeast of the US. They became American citizens quite quickly. They went to school in English starting from the second generation. A lot of interracial marriages. July 4th it was a lot more ce celebrated than St. John the Baptist on June 24th. And what happened over time is that laws were imposed starting from 1818, uh, 1918 in Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. And this was really the beginning of the end. Also, the question of the melting pot in the US, English is a very significant language. So there's sort of an integration of French Americans. And if we look like Manchester, New Hampshire, a quarter of French Americans, Franco Americans, were already assimilated. Uh, and uh, Quebec French speaking media, about two. Or, or French media, rather in the US, there were 200. In 1912, there was 33. And 37, 25 were left. So some root causes, uh, you know, are explained by this. That is very interesting. Especially those laws against the French language. I know that in Louisiana, it was the same. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, they imposed English in schools. Maybe Nathan, you could explain just a little bit uh, for the audience what happened, because I think that it was quite uh, similar to the situation in New England. Yes, we uh, say frequently that French was banned or, but what really happened is that in many constitutions in the state, especially 1921, 2021, there was a uh, succession of legislation, but to make it so, French is the only language of education. So yes, this had a terrible effect on French, uh, was both a stigmatization of French, uh, so it's not official, and uh, francophones did not have access to well the, the the language and how to teach it so uh, this led to several problems this is, was also done with uh, the practice of punishing and beating children speaking french in schools uh, such this really had a devastating effect on french in louisiana Yes, very much. This discussion here leads us to the broader question that we have for tonight, and is what is the future of Francophony in the US? And what should we do to preserve that aspect of culture and the French language? So that's a question for all of you uh, three here. I don't know if anybody would like to uh, uh, take this one first. Well, maybe I can start by saying that uh, exercises like tonight, these initiatives with the Centre Francophonie Zemeck, is one example. It's about making, maintaining, creating relations, teaching history in Quebec also. We need to remind ourselves of that period that lasted 90 years where we lost a million inhabitants. So it would be 12.6 million inhabitants today had it not been of this exodus. So uh, links with uh, uh, French Canadian families present in uh, the different places in Louisiana, where uh, it's very strong in Louisiana. So collaborations, uh, the delegations abroad and the Quebec government in that context show how vital is important to maintain a international diplomatic network, but it really goes to education, both on the American side and try to also let people know about this importance of uh, this duty of having a memory of, of this. Lizzie or Sarah, I don't know if you. Sure, I, 
can respond. I, uh, that's a good segue, Patrick, in speaking about education, because part of our goal here um, is to educate um, our local communities and engage our local communities, but also on a national scale, working with the National Park Service. Uh, in our region, you know, the mining, the copper mining really started to decline and the area started to deindustrialize um, by 1920. So it's really been about a hundred years since there was um, quite a um, exodus from our area as well. People went downstate. We know um, Francophones did return to Canada and go other places. Um, so it's been a long time since French was spoken even in families here. Um, and so part of what we want to do is, is um, acknowledge that history, recognize that history and start understanding how many of the parts of our landscape like this church and many um, street names and town names uh, you know, we would like to, to understand those histories and for the communities to understand them. So that's one step. Exactly. Um, you know, and this, this education, I know, uh, Nathan, vous avez mentioned... Nathan, you mentioned briefly immersion schools in Louisiana. Is that something that is becoming more popular? Yes. Answer yes, yes, for several years now. Uh, Figures are going up. I know that uh, today over 5,000 uh, students are um, signed up in immersion schools. That will open up a Saint Landry school, for example. And a new program for adults also called Saint Luke. So, yeah, there is definitely a lot of progress being made. Yes, and probably thanks to also a cultural renaissance, uh, being proud of our roots and whatnot. Uh, the question that we have received also is why has that part of American story uh, not been as well made known as other groups of immigrants? in the US. Is there a specific reason for this? Maybe Patrick or Sarah? Answer, well, French Canadians were one group among others in a melting pot with 335 million inhabitants in the US. Today, we hear them and see them very little. There's no more French newspapers. Well, maybe one in Florida, but very much managed by Quebecers. So I think Louisiana is leading by example with museums, having relations with the delegation in Boston and Rhode Island, uh, a, very much an academic city of Boston. So relations have been created along the years, but uh, Quebecers are one source of immigration. There were so many sources. I talked about Irish, uh, Scottish, Chinese, Italians, people from around the world after the first and second world war. The French Canadian immigration also stopped around 1930. So that is a good 90 years since that immigration is now over. But indeed, history books are still published about this. David or Gourmet, a distinct, distinct alien race was published last year. Yves Robbie's books also are the reference on uh, Franco-Americans. One in English, one in French, and Gérard Bro on the French Canadian heritage in New England. So four or five books. And the uh, Tisserand du Pouvoir is a series also that I would love to see uh, produced with a maybe a new version by uh, CBC or uh, Télé Québec, maybe uh, in co production with PBS. Why not? No, why not? All right, well, we have five minutes left, and I see that uh, there are several questions in the chat, including one by Robin. So I'd like maybe j just to uh, give a rapid fire here. So one question I found interesting here is, if Quebec was a U.S. state, would French have been preserved? I think maybe Louisiana gives an example that it is quite difficult to preserve a language uh, other than English in the US. Uh, Nathan, I don't know what you think. Pour, pour, uh, à propos du Québec, je sais pas si... About Québec? Well, oh, my, 
c'est difficile. Yes, well, maybe with a, you know, parallel with Louisiana. Well, I think uh, the real problem was that uh, the beginning of the uh you know 19th century such a rupture with the language really a divide where a whole generation stopped uh sharing transferring their uh language to a new generation for example my grandparents at that moment from that moment on it's very difficult to once again take ownership of that language you need to justify it becomes an effort a task a workload to learn the language in any country and where, you know, English is so dominant, you know, why would we do this? There needs to be underlying reasons, economic reasons, cultural reasons, and uh, relations also with other uh, French speaking areas. So that's, that's, I think that's why, that's what we're trying to see now and why it's so important to also create relations with other French speaking uh, areas. For example, immersion students, other youth see French as a, global language, not only as something related to uh, uh, her heritage. So I think this being open to this is, is really the key here. Patrick, since you're a Quebecer here, would you have anything to add to this? Well, as the American culture's steamroller, English language as a dominant language, even more dominant than at the time. The U.S. Uh, having been a empire for well if quebec uh, was a u.s american state probably a quebec would still officially be bilingual with possibly french as a uh, slightly majority language but this would be a complicated situation quebec would probably have obtained a uh, distinct status and now this is really hypotheses but it would have been really hard to preserve french but Quebec had a pretty good foundation, about 2 million inhabitants at the time. We would have been able to preserve uh, the French uh, distinction based on Jean Baudouin's Nadeau's article in the Devoir this uh, week. We talk, talk about uh, uh, the, yeah, we talk about 33 million people able to speak French in North America. And here we're talking, we include American descendants. But I think there's a revival in, uh, in the US to. Uh, get to know our history in order to face the future and going back to our roots during covid right is even is more popular genealogy uh, also very strong in the us we received several questions on genealogy um, and uh, especially changing names in from French to English and the, their evolution. Uh, Sarah, I think on, on, on this evolution of, of, of names and how they've maybe changed specifically, specifically pardon, in the Great Lakes region. Sure. Well, you saw in the in my presentation about the Gregoire family who quite quickly started calling themselves Gregory um, as they had a wider um, uh, you know, sort of clientele for their lumber. Um, and here in the in this region, the Kiwana, um, there are still a lot of families who have uh, French surnames. And as far as I know, none of them um, have retained um, speaking French in their families. I see some of the people in the chat saying the same thing about living in Maine um, with, you know, uh, French surnames, but not a lot of it spoken. So again, you know, um, we have found some great uh, documentation uh, from the 1930s and 40s, there are some wonderful films of sort of elderly people singing um, French folk songs here in this region. We're really hoping to learn more about that and sort of the history of their language use. So. Yes, okay, so we have one minute left, but for uh, people who would like to, you know, look into this, into the roots. Uh, all you three, do you have recommendations, books, websites? Where can we get started if we are thinking about maybe saying, okay, well, my roots are from Quebec, or, you know, I have a Franco-Louisianian roots. 
Where can we get started to look into this? Well, the Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques, obviously the website, are David Rummett, Gérard Bro, Yves Roby in both languages, and the Les Tisserands du Pouvoir series that might be accessible on the internet. It's already a good start. And then obviously, delegations in Quebec to get to know even more on the relations we have in all the Francophonie and the US. Nathan, are there resources for people looking into this? and uh, looking into French Louisiana. Yes, the Louisiana Center of Study by the Louisiana Lafayette University is a good, a good, good start. They have pages with descriptions and also there's a book that I like very much and uh, I can put the book in the chat. It's called French Cajun Creole Huma. It's quite succinct, quite brief, not too, uh, uh, not too much of a tough read, but gives a good overview of the community. I think it's a good start. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, just a one last uh, word to Sarah. Um, do you want to just one more time talk quickly uh, about that in the last minute? Sure. Yeah. Um, here, I'll put the website in the chat, QAnonHistory.com. I know it's a little hard to spell, so there it is. Um, if you think you have family or um, you know, families who you're interested in learning about who may have come through the Copper Country, um, you can use our Explore app and put in a name and see if they were here and potentially find out where they lived. And we are continually adding more data, so eventually you should be able to find out where they worked as well. Um, and I was just gonna say to follow up on some of the books, I mentioned um, the book by my colleague Jean Lamar called French Canadians in Michigan. There's a whole series of those for many um, of the United, of many of the US states. Um, so um, those are good places to start as well. Très bien. Et malheureusement, il est déjà Very well, unfortunately it is already seven. PM and we have to conclude the discussion. Thank you very much to Patrick, Nathan, and Sarah for your presentations tonight. And obviously thanks to you for attending this uh, panel, this webinar. Uh, at the end, we have a short survey to uh, fill in that will appear in your browser. But from uh, the CFA and the delegation here. Have a good evening and see you soon. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir.